So there you are, you've got uh, a, an extra contribution there from Benjamin Zephaniah from his album Revolutionary Minds, a brilliant album and that is one of the tracks, of, that, that, that's a poem but on the album it's set to music and it's called uh, What Stephen Lawrence Has Taught Us. And for those of you who were here a little bit earlier, um, you would have heard a piece of music playing. It wasn't just a random piece of music. I like to give you a little bit of culture. Um, it was a song by a brilliant uh, British jazz collective called Sons of Kennet. And the song is called My Queen is Doreen Lawrence. Doreen Lawrence, obviously the mother of Stephen Lawrence and a doggy, determined and doughty campaign. Why did I play you that piece of music? Or why uh, is there a focus on Stephen Lawrence? Because of course, Stephen Lawrence and the death of Stephen Lawrence and what emerged in the aftermath of Stephen Lawrence's murder in 1993 has played a critical role in transforming the dialogue and the debate and the landscape around racism in Britain. Marcia will speak uh, in a short while and will tell you about the fight for justice that she and her family have fought following the death of her brother Sean at the hands of the police in 2008. So Sean's death was 15 years after the murder of Stephen Lawrence. The murder of Stephen Lawrence at the hands of a racist white gang in South East London. And nine years after the publication of the report written by Sir William McPherson that bears Stephen's name, the Stephen Lawrence Inquiry Report. Because why does Stephen Lawrence matter? He matters not because he was the only young black man to die a violent death at that time, or indeed ever. At that time, the early 1990s, there was in fact a spate of racist attacks, a serious upsurge of racism in many ways fermented by groups like the British National Party, the Nazi British National Party, who had its headquarters in and around the area where Stephen was murdered. There were other young black people, people like Roland Adams, like Rohit Dugar, like Rahula Aramesh, who died at the hands of racists in the early 90s. And it wasn't either the case, it was just the Lawrence family that had a campaign of justice. I had the great privilege of meeting Richard Adams at that time and in the years afterwards, and Richard was as determined, as dogged, as doughty a campaigner as Doreen and Neville Lawrence. It wasn't simply the fact that they were campaigners, um, uh, uh, but there was something about Stephen Lawrence's death that captured the headlines and uh, led to the establishment of the Stephen Lawrence, who actually forced the then Labour opposition uh, under Tony Blair, with Jack Straw as the Shadow Home Secretary, to say that if they became the government, they would launch an inquiry to establish the reasons why Stephen died. The, camp, the family had always said that there was something that stank about the police investigation into Stephen's death, that there was something rotten and corrupt at the heart of the police, and they were determined to expose that rotten corruption, and therefore Jack Straw was forced to announce that he would initiate an inquiry. He did that as Home Secretary when he became Home Secretary in 1997. That inquiry ran through much of 1998, and it concluded with the publication of a report in February 1999. And when that report was published, it's also Sir William McPherson. Let me just say one thing. McPherson himself has always said, he's in his 90s now, from the day that he published the report, he always said, let's remember it by the name of the young man who was murdered. Call it the Stephen Lawrence Inquiry Report, not the McPherson Report. And I think that's very important. And he came up with this uh, very important conclusion. It recognised the existence of institutional racism, which he characterised as a collective failure of an organisation to provide an appropriate and professional service to people because of their colour, cultural, ethnic origin. He went on to say it can be seen or detected in processes, attitudes and behaviour which amount to discrimination through unwitting 
prejudice, ignorance, thoughtlessness and racist stereotyping that disadvantage minority ethnic people. So he presented his report to Jack Straw. Jack Straw presented the report to Parliament and when he presented the report to Parliament in February 1999, he did so, Straw, with this pledge. And Macpherson himself has said, I want Stephen's death to be a lasting, to, uh, Stephen to be, be to this report and Stephen's memory to be a lasting testimony to give our society a chance to change. And when he accepted and presented the report, this was what Straw said. He want, I want this report to serve as a watershed in our attitudes to racism, act as a catalyst to permanent and irrevocable change, and so on. And the report came with 70 recommendations about policing and about the wider institutions in society. Uh, focused primarily upon the police, but not exclusively so. It talked about how local councils operate, how housing authorities operate, how schools, how universities operate, all of our public bodies. He accepted every single one of the recommendations of the report, and as, in a sense, the government's commitment to it, he passed the Race Relations Amendment Act 2000, which would supposedly lead to the rooting out of racism and placed a positive onus upon all public bodies to promote race equality. So 25 years on from the publication of that, 20 years from the publication of that report, 25 odd years since the murder of Stephen Lawrence, where are we? Well, we have had a whole raft I'm not going to bamboozle you with statistics, but we've had a whole raft of reports looking at the way in which British society operates. And it shows how little progress has been made in the decades since. There was a report into... I'll show you this. Um, again, as I say, I don't want to bamboozle you with statistics, but this is a graph which shows... I'm not, the question of school exclusion. School exclusions has always been a massive issue for black Caribbean and African communities. Since Bernard Cord wrote a landmark report in 1971, how the West Indian child is made educationally subnormal in the British school system, the question of underachievement and exclusions amongst black children has always been a massive issue. This is a graph on the question of exclusions in a report, the Timpson report, that was published, I think, just a couple of months ago. And it shows the massive disproportionality, if you see here, the massive disproportionality in the number of children of mixed white and Caribbean, black Caribbean, and uh, a, a black African origin. Massive disproportionality on the question of permanent exclusions. It's the same with temporary exclusions. It's also the same on the question of attainment. Uh, how many GCSEs you achieve? How many A-levels and what grades you achieve? It's absolutely the case in universities. You're much less likely to go, if you're from a black background, to go to the prestigious Russell Group universities. There are indeed Oxford, you know, the, the, the university that all the prime ministers seem to go to, there are Oxford colleges that have not offered a place to a black British born student in over a decade. That was the outcome of, of the conclusion of a report that David Lally MP um, uh, uh, commissioned when he was a higher education minister and he continues to monitor these things since, since then. He also wrote a report in 2017 that looked at the criminal justice system, a report actually that was commissioned by the outgoing Prime Minister David Cameron and there are reasons why Cameron was forced to publish that report. Um, now he looked at the criminal justice system and his conclusion, 2017, so almost 20 years after the publication of the Lawrence Inquiry report, his conclusion, black and minority ethnic individuals still face bias, including overt discrimination in parts of the justice system. Despite making up 14% of the 
actual population could be destroyed. Uh, blacks make 25% of the prison population. 40% of young people in custody are from black minority ethnic backgrounds. And actually, if our prison population represented, reflected the makeup of England and wealth, there would be 9,000 fewer prisoners. Stop and search. At the time, and stop and search was, <laughs> Macpherson himself said, was the principal reason why he was forced reluctantly to accept the existence of institutional racism. At the time he wrote the report, you were six times more likely to be excluded uh, under the main provision, the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, six times more likely to be stopped and searched if you were black than if you were white. At the time when Lamy's report, there was another report that was published just after Lamy's report, so in 2017, and it showed you were six times more likely to be excluded. So no progress whatsoever. And indeed, actually, there is a particular specialised provision that the police have when they have concerns about imminent violence or violence that has just occurred that allows them to initiate stops and search. There was a report published just a couple of months ago, March 2019, that suggested, I think the figure was, you were 168 times more likely to be stopped if you were black than if you were white. The deaths in custody, and Marcia will no doubt talk about this again, a report that Theresa May was forced to commission at, because of pressure by people like Marcia Rigg, Inquest, the United Families and Friends campaign, a report they didn't want to publish, that the then Home Secretary Amber Rudd tried to sit on for ages, that showed the massive disproportionality in deaths at the hands of the police. So let me just, uh, just say a couple of other things. Why does institution, so absolutely, unquestionably the case that institutional racism continues to deeply divide and is deeply embedded in our society. Why? I want to really say two particular things. Firstly, because in truth, there never was a serious, lasting commitment to change. If there had been, the first thing that Jack Straw would have done as Home Secretary would have been to sack Paul Condon, the Metropolitan Police Commissioner, man who at the time of the Lawrence report, at the time of the inquiry, had stood determined and steadfast against any recognition of institutional racism within the police, said he would resign if that report concluded that there was institutional racism. He proved that he wasn't a man of his word because Despite McPherson's conclusion, he did not resign, but Straw didn't sack him either. It, newspapers like The Sun, The Mail, The Telegraph, the day the report was published, did everything they could to try and destroy and discredit it and say that it was a, a loony left nonsense, that there was no institutional racism at all. The rhetorical commitment to change, you know, the... the, the, the legislation, the bit of money that was made of it. For a short period of time, money was thrown at schools, local councils. I would be a rich man today if I had a pound for every local authority, including the one where I live now, Lambeth, who invited me as a race equality expert to come and help them draw up a Stephen Lawrence action plan that was supposedly a system to root out institutional racism in their ranks. Well, the statistics, the figures that we can go through today show you how far and how long that lasted. Within a couple of years, Straw had been replaced by David Blunkett. David Blunkett abandoned the Stephen Lawrence Action Group, which included Doreen Lawrence, that was supposedly monitoring the progress that was made. But crucially, it, particularly on that question of stop and search, the then Prime Minister, Tony Blair basically, by the beginning of the 2000s, said to the police, forget all that nonsense, come off the wall, stop being defensive. And there was a specific reason why he did it, the war on terror and the need to demonise Muslims. He literally said in the aftermath of launching the war on terror, I quote, the rules of the game have now changed. In other words, go back on the offensive, ramp up the stops and searches, and there was a massive, 
huge increase in stops and searches to well over a million in the years after. Secondly, and I know I need to begin to wind up, two minutes. Why does institutional racism, so there was no real lasting commitment. Secondly, why does it exist? More broadly, I would say that institutional racism exists because that it, it always represented something much more deeply rooted and much more profound than is captured by the definition that McPherson gave us. He didn't invent the term institutional racism. It, it was, in fact, a term first coined in the 1960s by the black American political activists Charles Hamilton and Stokely Carmichael, once as the Black Panthers. And they coined it to describe the way in which racism is structured, necessarily structured, into the kind of society that we live in. It, in and, and I think there are two things that that highlights. Firstly, it shows that racism, we're often made to believe that racism is just about completely ignorant, usually jackbooted, skinheaded thugs and marginalised, isolated council estates. They're the people who are racist, not our prime ministers. Uh, who can speak a foreign language or occasionally might go to a Sikh temple and wear a turban and say hello to them. They're not racist. Actually, what this, a real understanding of institutional racism shows is that racism starts at the top of society. It starts at the top and it seeps down. It seeps down to others. Why does it start at the top? Because it's the people at the top, the rich and powerful, who own and control all of the resources who need to find ways to ensure that they continue to maintain their ownership and control of the raw resources. So they need to divide us. When things become difficult, when massive economic crises hit and destroy people's lives, create misery in people's lives, somehow someone else has to be blamed. Not the bosses and the bankers who cause the crisis, someone else has to be blamed. So Muslims, who are responsible for creating a, a fear in our communities because they're all determined to bomb us to death. Or it's blacks who are coming over and taking our jobs, to, you know, jumping the queue for council houses, they're breeding and so their children are taking school places or they're taking uh, pl uh, places in the hospital queues. It is a critically important point, I think, for us as Marxists. Because it understand, it's understandable that pe yeah, um, uh, it, uh, people can accept the racist ideas, but they don't automatically accept them. The experience of living, going to school, <coughs> ed being educated together, going to college together, people increasingly forming relationships and so on, and going to work together and struggling together breaks down the rotten racist ideas. And they have to be constantly reinforced. And that is how and why institutional racism is so important for the people at the top of society, why they constantly have to reinforce it, and why, despite the fine intentions of people like McPherson and the fine words of Jack Straw's 1999 pledge, 20 years later, we still have institutional racism, and if anything, precisely because the crisis has got deeper, longer, and they're less able to find solutions, it is every bit, if not more deeply, embedded than it was at the time that that report was published. Uh, right, um, good afternoon. Thank you for coming. My name's Marcia Rigg. Um, for those who do not know me, uh, my brother died in police custody in August 2008. And so thank you for that, Brian. I, I'm not going to really go into um, statistics and stuff, because Brian's kind of given you that. I'm going to try and put um, the real um, context on how they actually do it to, to, to families and the process that they use to do what Brian has just said that he did. So, um, Sean died in 2008 and when he was picked up by police officers and arrested, restrained in the prone position um, for approximately seven minutes, put into the back of a police vehicle and driven at speed to Brixton Police Station where he was kept in the van, the back of the van, for 11 minutes before he was removed in a collapsed state 
and where it is captured on CCTV that as soon as he enters the caged area, which is like about four, four steps or so from the van, um, he's collapsed on the floor. Now, the officer's evidence is that they just thought that he was asleep and um, he wasn't being violent. They just really thought he was asleep. Even though um, the audio, where you can be heard, that there's other things that have been said that I'm not going to actually go into right now because I don't really think I have the time. And, um, and they can be seen that they couldn't recognise that Sean didn't have mental health issues. They'd arrested him for theft of his own passport, claiming that they didn't think that it looked at like him. And it was obvious that he did have mental health issues. It was obvious that the passport was his. And, and within less than an hour, within 40 minutes or so, 50 minutes, my brother was dead. And you see him die on camera. You know, you see the officers stand him up and pick him up, where the officers claimed that he just stood up by himself and he just suddenly collapsed and died. They have no idea why. They claimed that in, in the journey back from the um, arrest scene, um, he was on his back, upside down, um, with his legs in the air, in the footwell um, part of the, of the van, caged van, spinning 360 degrees, walking his feet on the walls, all the way back to the station while they sped back to the station. Even though the medical evidence, the dimensions and everything shows that it was implausible for that to have happened. You know, the conclusion at the end of the case is that he did, basically. But, you know, I, I, I might touch on that at the end. But, but what happened is, first of all, the Home Office or the Coroner's Office will seize the evidence. That is the body. They seized the body and we were not able to identify Sean or to see him um, or to hug him. You know, was he really dead? Is it Sean? Um, and what had happened is that when your loved one dies in state custody, the body actually belongs to the state. They say that the body belongs to them and not the family. And um, they didn't want us to see the body until six days after he had died. But they had conducted an autopsy the very next morning without us identifying him. They had given us a badly, severely decomposed body for burial seven months, seven weeks later. Um, we had a, our own pathologist, independent pathologist, and when he went to conduct the, the, the autopsy, Sean's heart and brain um, was not in his body. Um, this is something that is not isolated. There are many families whose loved ones have been buried without their body parts. Doesn't just happen in the United States, it definitely happens here. Um, and there are you know, many families that, that it happens to. Decomposed bodies that are sealed, so when they give the, the coffin or the, the deceased body back to the family, the mother can't even look at her son because he's so decomposed. His body fluids, the, the skin has been um, you know, is removed, and she can't see her son. This is the reality of it. But this is just the beginning of it. Because then it took seven months for them to interview the police officers um, as to what actually happened when we had the Independent Police Complaints Commission that was conducting what they called independent investigation, but we were not able to depend on them in any way because we couldn't understand why they were not going to interview the officers. You know, Sean died at their feet, literally. Why were they not going to, to, to ask that? That obviously gives them the opportunity to collude. In fact, they were able to immediately, uh, um, after Sean's um, body had been taken by the London Ambulance Service, um, with it that night, there were meetings inside Brixton Police Station, what they call gold meetings, <coughs> 
um, with the police, with the IPCC, the Police Federation, solicitors, Scotland Yard, the you know, DPS. They hadn't even told us that Sean had died yet. And a press release had already been put out. Um, it's it's um, quite a long process. It was actually 11 years ago. So fast forward, there was an inquest in 2012, which was four years after the, the death. Because the process of gathering the um, documentation, the evidence, was, was piecemeal. There were delays, there were pre-inquest reviews, we were trying to get hold of the copies of the CCTV, the audio, the IPCC had evidence that they filed under what they called um, um, the, the file escapes me, but it was a file where they didn't think that the evidence was um, useful at all, but that's actually where the, the best evidence was because somebody had taken a picture of the restraint on their mobile phone and the IPCC didn't investigate it. You know, it was two photos that was taken four minutes apart and Sean was still in the same position. You know, at the end, at the end of the day, 11 years later, the officers explained <coughs> that away because none of the witnesses said that they turned him to his side so that he could breathe. Um, but the officers all said that they turned him on his side. We could have turned him on his side in the middle of those four minutes or we turned him on his side after the photographers had been taken because <coughs> there was a four minute gap, right? No witnesses saw that. All witnesses said that one of the officers was on his um, neck and he was always in the prone position, face down. Because my answer to them is, well, if you turned him to his side, I, I don't care, why, why is he dead then? Hmm. You know, why is he dead? If you did all the right things, why is he dead? Because he was fit and healthy. There was no drugs or alcohol in his system. You know, I see online that, you know, people have been, you know, believe that Sean was um, high on drugs and he was a criminal and he, and he was completely nothing of, of the sort. He was just a vulnerable young black man that was actively psychotic, that all the witnesses and the 999 calls that had been made, you know, it was obvious. And the only people that didn't recognise this were the actual police officers. So they claim. And, and at the inquest, um, 11 ordinary members of the public found that the actions of the officers, or inactions, more than minimally contributed to his death, which was the right decision. But it was just a, a narrative, because an inquest is not a criminal jurisdiction. Because of the stark contrast, there was then the first of its kind of um, independent <coughs> review into the investigation. The Sylvia Casali re report, all of these are um, public documents. We have the Sylvia Casali report, all again reports following the McPherson report, you know, the reports that, um, that Brian just talked about. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. These were the reports in the Sean Rigg case. And, thank you, that report, because the IPCC's report had found absolutely no wrong doing whatsoever of the police officers. In fact, their conclusion in two, of, in two and a half lines was that the officers adhered to policy during the transportation to Brixton Police Station. That's the spinning in, in, the, in the back of the van, apparently, that didn't happen as far as I'm concerned. And then um, that, and then Bernard, Sir Bernard Hogan Howe, who also was the commissioner at the time, um, commissioned a review into mental health and policing. And we had the Lord Victor Adewale report, which found that one in four people suffered with mental health and that the police were using excessive force um, on members of the public, vulnerable people, and that um, there was a disproportionality in, in black deaths. Um, we then had, the case was reopened as a criminal investigation. The files went to the Crown Prosecution Service, which found that there was insufficient evidence. You know, one of the sergeants had claimed that he went to the back of the van and had, did a risk assessment on Shaw, but we proved that he did nothing of the sort and he never entered 
he never came out of the custody suite. And we had the first perjury trial um, in Britain <coughs> in a death in custody. But we had to fight and appeal that um, with the Crown Prosecution Service. And they actually reversed their decision, which was, you know, quite a big, a big thing to have happened in the, in the criminal justice system. And we thought that we would, you know, we, we can get this man. We have CCTV evidence that he, 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 his account was implausible. But he was acquitted. He was acquitted. And I found that that, that hit, um, case, criminal case was, was a complete sham and was based on the original flawed investigation of the IPCC. Um, we then had issues with the officers attempting to retire, which is another thing that all the officers attempt to do, so that they um, do not have to be um, answered to their actions or uh, of, of their restraint. And usually that's what happens. And again, um, I fought uh, legally for, um, for that not to happen. One of them had attempted to retire. The Metropolitan Police had agreed that he could retire. And I found out, uh, but when I did, he had to give a 28-day notice period. He still had five days left. And so I instructed my solicitor immediately that effectively he was still employed by the Metropolitan Police. And I won that case. And his um, retirement was suspended. He then um, has entered the Church of England. He is now an ordained priest. He attempted to retire again, and he lost his, um, uh, he lost his case. And then we had, because he was up for, for criminal, for criminal, um, he was up for crime, criminal um, case with all the other officers, with the Crime Prosecution Service, who was, who look, was looking at manslaughter, um, they were looking at gross negligence, manslaughter, perjury, um, perverting the course of justice, health and safety. It all came back, insufficient evidence. I appealed it. They still came back and said, insufficient evidence. Even though on the, on the CCTV, when my brother is being stood up, there's an officer, well, none of this is in the public domain yet, but it is the facts, an officer that says you cannot get a dead man standing. And when I have a meeting with the Crown Prosecution Service, I said, didn't you see this evidence? And they said, did you hear that? Because it's visual and audible and clear. And the answer to that was, yes, we can hear him say that, but we do not know in what context it is being said. But there's only one dead man in the station, and he's looking at him when he says it. We had gross misconduct this year, 11 years in, where the officers uh, made applications that because it had taken 11 years, um, it, was, it would not be a fair hearing because they can't remember what happened. How on earth can that be? Because the case has been alive for 11 years. Uh, we had the Angelini report where I met with Theresa May when she was um, the Home Secretary. Angelini report happened because of me. It happened because of the mother of Shaney Lewis. Where I met with Theresa May, she commissioned for the first time uh, a review into the way that this country uh, deals with deaths in custody. That report has a hundred and odd recommendations and the Home Office is still looking into that at the moment. Um, since the, the, the um, gross misconduct hearing, all the officers, by the way, were exonerated and they did absolutely nothing wrong according to uh, the system. And in fact, I've recently seen the uh, solicitor for the Police Federation and the solicitor that acted for all of the officers in my brother's case, Colin Reynolds, um, recently did a speech with the Federation to say that his officers had always basically been innocent all this time. It should never have taken 11 years. Uh, the cost that it has taken um, the case at the taxpayers' money, by the way, 
and the fact that they are traumatised, suffering with post-traumatic stress, and their families and their wives and their children, and that they are considering, and that he is considering, um, a claim against the IPCC for the delays in the case. Really? This is the reality of it. That's just my case. There are hundreds and hundreds of cases. There have been over, you know, nearly 2,000 deaths in police custody in the United Kingdom. No accountability whatsoever. I'm going to just quickly wrap up with just a short speech, because um, you probably will have questions, and there, would, there is a bit more I'd like to say, but I'm going to say a very a short excerpt so, from a, a speech by um, Frederick Douglass that was given in... 1852. It's regarding the 4th of July and what the 4th of July is to the American slave. And these are words of the great Frederick Douglass. This is a bit of it. The 4th of July basically is a day that reveals to him, him being the slave, more than any other day of the year the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is a constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham, your boasted liberty and unholy license, your national greatness, swelling vanity, your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your denunciation of tyrants, brass-founded impudence, your shouts of liberty and equality are hollow and a mockery. Your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgiving, with all your religious parade and solemnity, are to him, meaning the slave, mere, a mere bombast, fraud, deception, impunity and hypocrisy. A thin veil to cover up crimes, which disgrace the nation of savages. There is not a nation on the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than the people of the United States at this very hour. At a time like this, scorching irony, not convincing argument, is needed. Oh, had I the ability and could reach the nation's ear, I would today pour forth a fiery stream of biting ridicule, blasting reproach, withering sarcasm and stern rebuke, for it is not light that is needed, but fire. It is not a gentle shower, but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind, and the earthquake. The feeling of the nation must be quickened. The conscience of the nation must be roused. The propriety of the nation must be startled. The, the hypocrisy of the nation must be exposed. And it is crimes against God and man must be proclaimed and denounced. Frederick Douglass, once a slave and who became a brilliant and powerful leader of the anti-slavery movement, 
Is it possible to give their names so in case we come across them? Schools <laughs> talk to the children or, um, or, or um, set up a football team or whatever. We find them to know their names that they're still working on, where they're working. Yeah. Um, all right. The man behind you, yes. Thank you. Um, um, yes, I, I, I'd just like to salute Marcia for that speech because I just think it's tremendous. When you think that you've had to fight for 11 years and you're still fighting, and this is the experience of families mm. up and around the country who've lost somebody uh, at the hands of the state. And I think it's, it's shocking, but it's not surprising about institutional racism today. And I think. That I, I suppose what, what I want to do is just comment that there's essentially two points that I think are interrelated, integrated into Marcy's and Sean's story, which also reflect and I think can generalise. One is the question of accountability in institutions, and the other is and, and accountability in any organisation under capitalism. The way that bureaucracies and managers um, lie. Um, they construct grievance procedures where they sit there and they lie, or they don't even hear the grievances. Uh, within workplaces, anybody who's a union rep is representing anybody will know this. And the other thing, though, is the scale of, the race, of racism in the, in, in the British society that is embedded in the institutions, in, and the institutions and the lack of accountability then creates, uh, creates a mechanism for that racism to flourish. Because there is no accountability, it doesn't matter what you do or say, and you can be as racist and as abusive as, as, as some of these stories have demonstrated. And they've, got away, and they've got away with it. And the question I think is, you know, there's a, there's a story on the front page of The Guardian, I work in higher education, I'm Frank president at UCL, of the, of, the, of the UCU union. UCL is a posh university, it has very small numbers of black British uh, students getting to it, very large numbers of international staff, so it looks on the one, on the one hand multicultural, global the university and all the rest of it, but on the other hand, when it comes to the lived experiences of black working class children, black working class adults, then entering into, the, into, into, into workplaces like that, being able to participate in it, the Guardian report is full of those stories that afflict across the university sector. That, that people are not getting into it. And that's a different question. It's, it, it's to do with the way that racism is not about unconscious bias. It is about, it, it's integrated into the system of power and the reproduction of knowledge as part of that power system. So I think, you know, if you're not a revolutionary uh, going into this meeting, I hope that by coming out of this meeting, you realize that the only way of dealing with institutional racism is to deal with the institutions to overthrow them. Hello, comrades. Um, uh, my name is Timo. I'm a member of the <coughs> Socialist Workers' Party. Um, I've heard Marcia speak many, many times before, and actually, I have to say that each time I hear you speak, it's um, it's no less shocking, and it's it's really, really, really powerful. And it's like it's quite hard to listen to sometimes. So it must be quite hard for you to tell, you know. And I just bit would really hope that everyone pays tribute to you and actually say that we stand 100% behind you and side by side of you in your fight for justice. <laughs> because we need that story needs to be told. It's a story I've heard. I've been involved in campaigns a long time. I remember actually sitting alongside the parents of Roger Sylvester and watching a film called um, um, Injustice and watching them, you know, by the, the, watching them. <coughs> watch the story of their son being murdered and it was really really powerful and it's important that people keep doing that i want to come back to something that um, um brian said about stop and search because actually earlier i did a meeting about about knife crime and one of the uh, one of the, the fictitious narratives about knife crime is people have said that knife crime's gone up because the police have been disempowered since the stephen launch report and the attack on stop and search and all of this and i think we really need to debunk these myths it is true that for a short time when Theresa May was Home Office, um, was Home Secretary, that she had to address the, the, the glaring inequality, the knife crime, stop and search amongst the police went down um, for, for a short time. But actually, very interestingly, even though the number of stop and searches went down, 
actually the disproportionality between black people getting stopped and searched went up. So even when stop and search goes down, black people are still more targeted, still more targeted. And actually, in, in 2019, right, there has been a record number of stabbings, but actually, um, stop and search has gone up by something like 400%. Actually, the police have got special powers called sets in 60 orders, which they roll out whenever there's a stabbing, and people, young people are being stopped and searched all the time, and actually it's doing nothing to address this. And I think it's part of a sort of, you know, they like to target black people, they like to paint out, there's more drugs, there's more crime, and there's nothing. And I think what there's a, um, we talked about the Lamy report, there's another report by a group called um, Release, which brought out a thing called the Colour of Injustice, and they've, uh, they've, it's really good report. And I just want to uh, read out a bit of a quote about this. It says, um, while the police narratives around stop and search revolve around knives, gangs, organised crime groups, drug supply, county lines and modern slavery, our analysis tells a different story. One of deprived minority communities been over-policed and selectively criminalised for minor drug offences that are largely ignored in other contexts and by other groups. And I think that's really, really important to know that this is about social control. And I'm going to wind up by saying a qu one quick thing. is actually, we need to challenge. I think the last speaker was 100% right. I think actually there's this narrative that actually institutionalised racism comes about because there's too many sort of middle class white teachers or the justice system or whatever. And actually that's just a lie. Actually people have to work within a framework which is set down by the government. And actually, Boris Johnson is more likely to become our next Prime Minister. And it is no accident that the first policy announcement he made was that he was going to cut taxes for the rich. Because actually, the rich are all about getting richer and they want to use racism as a weapon to divide us. And actually, the, the, the deaths on our streets are a direct consequence of that. So actually, we need to keep fighting, we need to keep organising, and we need to make sure that we kick out these modern racist bastards. <laughs> Regional corporations, seen it done well here and, and in Trinidad, but then also, um, I think, kind of leading on from what you were saying, um, is the importance of the institutionalisation of, of things when it's done badly. However, much you might not want to make that decision, your guidelines and everything force you to treat that person in a certain way. Um, and I've always taken like the optional modules that I could in mental health and, and everything, and I'm 29. Um, and it wasn't until last week that I went to, I happened to go to a meeting on. Um, by a doctor called Jonathan Metzel, and it was on his book called um, A Protest Psychopathy. Um, and he was talking about the history of how now psychosis um, and schizophrenia makes people dangerous, and the police kind of will act in a, a kind of more aggressive way when they're just told the person has a history of mental illness or psychosis rather than that they're unwell at the time. Um, but he talks about how before the civil rights movement this wasn't the case and psychosis was a disease of docile white middle class women who returned to a childlike state and needed to be nurtured, they'd need to knit their illness away and you should invite them around to your, your house for food or it was of white middle class um, men who were so intellectual and above us all that we couldn't understand their language and that they were talking about all these complicated things. But then with the anti-psychiatry uh, anti movement and the civil rights movement and then the backlash to the civil rights movement, it became a disease of black hostile men and they were psychotic because they were reject rejecting whiteness and they were a threat to kind of our society. And also um, they were psychotic because they were choosing African names and um, kind of Islamic names. And I just thought it was really interesting how um, kind of to, to control it, the institutionalization and the creation of knowledge has meant that I have to treat these people as though they are hostile, whereas if I was treating them back then, I would be able to say, oh, let's do more talking therapies, why don't you do kind of the things you want to do? And I think that's the importance of the institute addressing the institutionalization rather than trying to get individuals to change their, their ways. Yes. Yeah, um, I've worked with uh, Janet Older on the Just Chris Crawley campaign for <clears throat> the last 21 years, and there are enormous uh, similarities between Christopher's case and Sean's case, and there's been a lot of mutual support between 
Marcy and her family and Janet and all the other campaigners that work with them. But <coughs> what I would say is we seem to keep going to meetings where people tell their stories. We go to protests at police stations and at courts and at inquests. And we go round and round and round. And there's always a new death in custody. But there's all the old ones that don't get resolved. Janet is still as angry 21 years later as she was when I first met her. And my question is, what can we do collectively to break through this sort of knot of official stonewalling, which lets you go to Downing Street and say, what's going on, lets you go to an inquest and says, what's going on, but never gives you an answer. And Janet is still getting letters saying, you can't say this, you can't say that, this is legally protected, they won't give you this evidence. And she spends a lot of her time just trying to get more evidence out of the system. And I think we actually need to take this kind of campaign into an area where we're challenging the Home Office and the system directly and say we're not going away, we're not going to just wait for another report. Janet's working on a book at the moment which hopefully will come out next year and tell her story. But actually we need to opt the campaigning in a way that gets more back. I think Grenfell have found exactly the same thing. The more the campaigning goes on, the less they actually do. So, <coughs> where do we go from here? Thank you. Um, we, we're going to run out of time, and I've only got, I can only, I've got four other people who want to speak, so try and keep it a bit yeah, tight, please. Yeah, this will be a um, I don't think there's a person in this room, Marcia, who wouldn't uh, stand with you and, and you know, congratulate you and, and the efforts you've made. My, my question is quite, two questions, quite simple, and they are directed directly at you, but was there ever an expectation that you would get justice for your case as one? I mean, I'm, I'm probably incredibly naive, but I grew up thinking that the British justice system was the pride of the world, and that, you know, we, we dealt with things appropriately, and, 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 and justice was, was something that people could expect, not, you know, have to fight for. Um, but in that, in this fight that you've you've been going through, um, obviously I'd like to know, you know, did you expect an outcome, and how has that affected you personally? You know, how have you dealt with what must be incredibly <coughs> disappointing? Right. Thank you for keeping it short. Okay. Not that the last. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, um, yes. Um, I just wanted to say that. Um, Brian talked about the Steve Morris inquiry, which I uh, which I, I attended, and I think uh, uh, part of the problem was that not only was Paul Condon let off the hook by Jack Straw, which he was, Paul Condon, the head of Metropolitan Police, should have been sacked at that time, but to be honest, the Metropolitan Police itself should have been disbanded because Metropolitan Police was shown to be a lethal force against certain. Uh, uh, parts of the population, mainly, for example, uh, uh, young black men, and that it was corrupt to the very core. To be honest, you, that's, that's the, that was the problem that Labour ducked, really, around the, the Lawrence Inquiry. They should have disbanded the Met. And I've reported on various uh, of these cases. I remember Brian Douglas, yes. another case, a young black man, murdered by the, uh, by the police in Brixton, uh, his overhead by an extendable baton. And I remember Shiji Lapiti, a Nigerian guy who was, who was beaten to death by the police in, in, in Clacton, in, in Hackney. I remember Harry Stanley, an Irish man who was shot dead on his doorstep uh, by the police, and, and the list could go on and on and on. And, and Marcy is right, you have to, uh, to understand institutional racism, you have to understand the pattern that emerges. And really the pattern that emerges is that the police have been allowed by politicians, by judges, by magistrates, by the IPCC to kill black people and minorities with impunity hmm. and get away with it. <laughs> this goes back to David Olawale, who the police in Leeds drowned, a Nigerian homeless man with, with mental health issues. They drowned in a river in 1969 in Leeds. So it's not, this, is, this is not new. And one of the things that I noticed was this. The first thing that the police do is, is literally tear apart the reputation of the person they have just killed. 
So Brian Douglas's case, for example, they put out a press release saying he was an extremely dangerous black man. Yeah. And this is motion of pathologizing black men, which has been going on for decades. And it's not accidental, has been a strategy of the state and, and politicians and press since the days of Suss and before that. Right? So they said, therefore, they had a right to murder him because they thought that he was going to kill them. Actually, the evidence showed that was not the case at all. Uh, they brought up, the police leaked to the press the fact that he had a conviction under the stop and search going back to the 1970s. They never said what the conviction was. And what it was, was that Brian Douglas was arrested and charged and convicted of having a metal coat to use in his head, yeah? And that, were, and that they used that to say that then, for potentially, he was a dangerous black man. Chi Chi Lupiti, they said, was, was out of control and they feared for their lives. In actual fact, and also, that he was carrying out large amounts of drugs on him. This man had just gone out to get a takeaway for his family, yeah. for a meal, right? Yeah. There were no drugs. There's no evidence that he ever attacked them. Uh, there was no evidence that he was out of control. They beat the man to death. Harry Stanley. He was walking home with a chair leg in a plastic bag. The police said we thought he had a shotgun and they shot him dead on his family doorstep. And the thing is, this, this is the pattern, this is what institutional racism means. It's not only that the police do this and they get away with it, but actually the powers that be allow them to do it, green light it, time and time and time again. Every time a policeman gets away with murdering a black person or an Irish person, working class person, the signal is, you can't be done for this. Mm. At the end of the day, you'll get away with it, right? Which is completely different for anyone else in this room, right? So these are not accidents, they're not isolated. You have to understand the pattern. And the pattern is this. Divine and rule comes from the top of society, and I believe that solidarity wells up from its roots. And that's, that's what we're talking about. That's the dynamic we're talking about. So the woman at the back, yeah. Oh. Uh, thank you very much, Marcia, for your story. For it's the first time I've heard it properly. Um, it's really important that we hear these stories because although it happened in 2008, for me, it's it's new, it's, it's relevant, um, and the details are very relevant <coughs> for me and for all of us. Um, and and what's also very important is that he had no alcohol in him, he had no drugs. This is really, really important to be said and to be known. Um, he was a vulnerable young man. Um, he had mental health issues, so he was really vulnerable. Um, they didn't let you see him for six days. No, uh, they didn't want us to, but we were able to see him. We argued and we saw him two days later. Um, and that's so important. Our young men, black, Asian, they are really vulnerable, really vulnerable because of this. Um, and to be by their side as much as you can is really important because you know, once the police uh, have their way with them, they, they are a hundred times more vulnerable than they are just walking uh, on the streets. Um, uh, yeah. Um, what, where was he arrested? That was uh, what I'd like to know because that's really important as well. Where these, where the young black men are arrested, at what you know, at what point, what place? I'd like to know that. Um, and uh, personal experiences. I have a foster son, and he's Bengali, and he was stopped and searched, and he was 14. Um, and a slip is supposed to be given to them when they're underage. Um, that, that they have been uh, stopped and searched, no slip was given to him. And then they're so embarrassed after these things happen to them that they don't even really tell you until... Um, uh, and two other experiences, um, uh, a young man I know, he was riding his bike and the police asked him to get off, uh, we want to search you, and he said, why? And they said, just get off your bike. And he's like, no, but why do you need to search me? So they dragged him off his bicycle, face down, and then the thing I didn't know the proposition, what that is. Um, so they did the same to him. Uh, then they arrested him for a risk, uh, resisting arrest because he refused to get off his bicycle. But the thing is, he can't breathe. Sorry? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then 
there was a, a European white man who, who held a knife, who held a knife to his, this a young man's sister's throat, but when they went to arrest him, they said, hello sir, could you please get into the car? So he got, a, he got such a different treatment. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just have one last contribution from the person in the front of the I'm sorry, I missed. Where? Here. that. Did I miss you? Sorry, I didn't see your hand. No worries. I'm sorry. Is this on? Yeah, it's on. Talking uh, to the top. I guess this one's just on in discussing the media. Did you put the mic closer? Yeah. Um, I guess one of the things which comes to light is just representation within our media. Um, as far as I know, within London, it's a city where uh, where ethnic minorities make up 44% of the population, and yet within our media, it's less than 3 to 4% of us that ever get there. So within journalism, I believe it's 3%. Within the whole creative industry, um, I'm a creative myself, so that crosses everything, but there's less than 4% of us. And so for us to ever have platforms in order to showcase and discuss this, because I guess our current media saturates the narratives in which are expressed, I just want to hear your experience with that. Alright, thank you. I'm really sorry if I missed you. I'm really sorry. I apologize to everybody. I'm going to ask Marcia to come back first because of these all the questions oh, that I did with you. you. Is that alright? If you give me a mic. Oh, that's all right. Come on. Okay, uh, okay, the lady at the top, you asked, you know, what are the officers doing? Okay, the one that was, uh, the one that attempted, basically, they're all working. So the one that attempted to be um, a, the, the priest, he is a priest. He was a priest while serving as a police officer because he had been suspended in the Sean Rigg case. So whilst he was had been suspended, he was still, he became a priest and he was ordained, basically. And he was, he came to the um, gross misconduct hearing in his dog collar. Yeah. And all will be revealed. I mean, it's just disgusting. And the um, sergeant attempted to retire as well, but they couldn't. I was able to hold them all back down leg um, legally, which is almost unheard of. And so they all went through um, right to the end for the gross misconduct. Some of the other, there were other officers at the station that night, all of them and sergeants, they all got away with it. So basically now, like I said, the, the, their solicitors saying that they are, because I saw it in an article, Federation article, a couple of weeks ago, that they're suffering from post-traumatic stress. And they're, um, I, I don't know where they are. But I know that they're not in prison, right? The officer's name is the officer's names are um, Andrew Burks, who is the priest, Matthew Forward, one of the officers, um, Sergeant uh, Paul White, who was a, the sergeant that night, Mark Harrett, uh, one of the arresting officers, and um, Richard Glasson, one of the arresting officers. All their names are in the public domain, so I don't feel any way in calling their names. So that's, is that what you needed? Yeah. And the lady that asked, um, the, the gentleman that said, you know, where do we go from now? Well, that's the discussions that we are having within UFFC, including with Janet. Because one of the things that I believe is that, I mean, nothing has changed, but we've got report after report after re report. The evidence shows the collective uh, pattern in all of the cases. Uh, I would love to just do a class action based on the evidence. And we come together um, and, and do a private prosecution or something like that. That's the only way. Because um, they're not going to reopen the past cases. Because what they like to do is to... Um, have all of the cases individually. It's got nothing to do with the other one. But if you can highlight the patterns, like, for instance, they don't interview the police officers in all the cases. 
decompose bodies. In all the cases, not all of them, but a lot of them. Um, there's so many things, excessive force. I mean, basically, they have training. In all the cases, what always comes up is they weren't trained. They weren't trained. Yes, they're trained. What training do you need to know if you have somebody face down in grass X amount of minutes that they can't breathe and die? What training do you need for that? Really? But it's in every case. And the, the force is, um, the excessive force that they've used is proportionate, even to the point of death, so they can kill them. They have a license to kill. That is a fact. Uh, they, they will say they don't. In fact, that's what I said at the end of the case on, on the news when I was interviewed. They have, it, they've got a license to kill. And um, Helen Ball from the Metropolitan Police um, went public and said that will be wholly wrong to say that. Who believes that in this room? Yeah, right. So um, we have to all collectively come together, right, and pressurise them. Um, grassroots and activists and academics and, you know, so many people, collectively, we are very powerful. And that's, what we, that's why I'm talking, I talk everywhere uh, to raise awareness. We have a platform online. You know, we didn't have that in 1852. We didn't have that when Stephen Lawrence died. You know, t times have evolved and so have we. So we can't give up and that's the answer. That's one thing I know we can't do. <laughs> yeah. Um, was there an expectation? Do you know what? Um, I didn't really know much about deaths and cussing until my brother died. So I was... Like you, I mean, I knew that these things happened. I didn't know the extent of it. Um, I got hold of a lot. I've got a lot of the evidence. We had a lot of, say, 95% of it. They got rid of some things. Um, how we got CCTV and audio. That's 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 very rare. Yeah. I thought I, there's no way we're going to lose this. There's no way, Janet Alden, there's no way. They're saying he's dead. He's dying. You can't get a dead man standing. You can see, you know, all these things. And the conclusion was, we thought he was asleep. And it was unfortunate that the sergeant thought he was faking it. That's the, that's the answer. Yeah, but my brother was dead. And that's it. Um, where was he arrested? He was arrested in, um, who's the lady that asked that? He was arrested in um, Brixton, in Weir Road. Um, he was having a psychotic episode. Um, and the hostel team where he was staying had, had um, made em six em five emergency 999 calls for the police to come and take him to a place of safety. So he was in a place of safety, right? But there they, they were no beds. And they called the police because he was acting bizarrely. He was a danger to himself and to the public, right? And what he needed was care, right? And they, they, you know, that doesn't cost anything. And then the police refused to come because they said that he hasn't done anything criminal. And he actively went on the street, um, naked from the waist up, just carrying his expired passport. He didn't have his keys or his phone. And all members of the public could see. And this CCTV evidence of him. You all haven't seen all of this yet. Yeah? I've saved the best till last. Yeah? He's on the street. He's obviously psychotic. There's witnesses. There were 999 calls made by the public. He's unwell. Oh, the police didn't see that. They, they arrested him for theft of his passport. Yeah, and so that, that's what happened there. And representations in the media. The media was my weapon, <laughs> was my absolute weapon. And my homework in the first school work was uh, we did a campaign for a year outside Brixton Police Station every Thursday at the time that Sean died between seven and nine when he left the station. <coughs> and... Um, just handed out leaflets and made statements and just talked to people. 
and the BBC got hold of us. One of the things that we did, which was why the Shawnbury case is so iconic, is that we didn't give them the opportunity to put out a picture and a narrative of Sean. Sean was a person that suffered with mental health, but that's, we don't want him to be remembered for that. Sean was a musician. Sean wrote his own music. He was a rap artist. He was intelligent. He was well-travelled. He was not a criminal. He was a father. He was my brother. He was a human being. And that's it. Whether he was black or white, doesn't matter. He was a human being. The jury found that they, they did not upheld his basic human rights. The jury at the inquest were... They just couldn't believe the evidence that they saw. The evidence was compelling. But it wasn't a criminal court. So we just have to work with the inquest. And, um, yeah. So that's what I used. And I used... Uh, we had a website. And... Um, I, I speak everywhere, internationally. I speak in universities. I spoke to the Criminology Society in um, Lincoln just this week. <coughs> YouTube. I want the recording. <laughs> um, the media is powerful because that's what they don't want. It's just you got to you do it yourself. And then when there's an interest, I don't have to call the media. My phone is off the hook with journalists and the media. I think I am Thank you very much for um, questions because I'm speaking uh, in the main room. Okay, we're going to give um, Brian, so if you could just be really patient, I'm sorry we we're, were running a little bit late. We can just give Brian a couple of minutes to sign. Thank you. Colleagues, Hassan, who spoke, wrote a really important chapter specifically on the Lawrence Inquiry in the book I edited, Say It Loud, in which he said that the Stephen Lawrence scandal was a watershed in British history and continues to dog the police and the establishment two decades after the murder in Mount Hall Road. All in all, this is very much unfinished business and there are serious lessons to be learned. I just want to reflect on that because, of course, the serious lessons include a recognition that institutional racism was not eradicated by McPherson. Moira is sat here wearing a t-shirt about Grenfell, where she, the area where she lives, and the Grenfell atrocity, an avoidable atrocity, which highlights institutional racism. People burned to death in the richest borough in this country because the local council had a contemptuous attitude to the black and minority ethnic and working class people who lived in that tower. Think about Windrush and think about the fact that we had the Windrush scandal exposed last year. The fact that people who came to this country, who worked all their lives in this country, who made a commitment and they dedicate, given dedicated service building, hospitals, schools, a transport network and so on, in the years in which they should be enjoying their pensions in comfort and safety and security, being told they're not British, they're not entitled to those pensions, they're not entitled to social security, healthcare, they're not even entitled to be in this country. That was introduced by the then Home Secretary, the current and outgoing Prime Minister, Theresa May in the 2014 Immigration Act. And that wasn't a mistake. She was told at the time that this would lead to the scandal that it led to, but she didn't care because what mattered at that time was outflanking their political opponents to the right. That is how institutional racism operates. Operates with impunity, operates in order to divide our side. I, but I want to end, however, on a note of hope, because I think the thing about racism is that it has had ebbs and flows. There have been times when we have been able to fight back against racism and make real and serious gains. People like me were able to go to university and so on in the 80s and so on because of the struggles that our predecessors had fought for inclusive education, for, uh, you know, against 
the horrors that our parents, the no dogs, no blacks, no Irish, things that they had to endure when they came to this country, because they organised and campaigned and fought back against those things, things got a bit better for us. The Lawrence Inquiry would not have come about. But first things, weak though it was, definition recognition of institutional racism would not have come about if people hadn't organised and campaigned. The deaths in custody report that Marcia talked about had to be commissioned by Theresa May because people like Marcia Rigg fought for it. The Lamy report came about because people campaigned and organised and fought for it. it hasn't got, of course it hasn't got rid of institutional racism, but these things have happened because people have organised and campaigned. The Lawrence campaign was a defining struggle. That's the chapter of Hassi's, uh, Hassan's uh, book, uh, chapter in the book. It was a defining struggle, but it came about not just because Jack Straw decided as an act of conscience to institute that inquiry. It was because there was a determined campaign up and down the country, led by Doreen and uh, Neville Lawrence. But they said themselves that there were two things that made a huge difference. Firstly, it was when Nelson Mandela, recently released uh, from prison, came over as a leader of the African National Congress and pledged his support for their campaign. That projected it into the international consciousness. But the other thing that made a difference, he said, Neville said that when he went to the Trade Union Congress and spoke to the Trade Union con Congress and got the unconditional, underwritten support of the Trade Union movement to back their campaign, it was that that enabled the campaign to keep going right through to the point where Jack Straw initiated that inquiry. That didn't just come about through nothing, it came about because people had supported the campaign from the day that it started. People went and supported the family, people took collections, took petitions around their workplaces, passed resolutions in their union branches, and got their, their workmates to, or, or to, to pledge their support. It was because miners, the might people, People who themselves had been the victims of the police during the miners' struggle recognised that the struggle of the Lawrence family was their, that the struggle that they had gone through was the same as the struggle the Lawrence family had, 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 had experienced. In other words, Hassan talked about solidarity rising from the bottom upwards. It was solidarity in action. Ordinary working class people coming together and supporting each, each other's struggles. That is the only way in which we can make progress. It's the only way in which the, pro the limited progress that we have made has been achieved in the past. It's the only way in which we will make progress in the future. But we have to use all things at our disposal, the media and so on. But ultimately, if we want to get rid of institutional racism, lock, stock and barrel, then we have to get rid of the society that breeds it, that, re re that relies upon it, and uses it to ensure that the rich stay at the top of society and ordinary working class people stay at the bottom. That's why we need a revolutionary transformation. That's what all of the debates and discussions at this festival have been about at Marxism, and that is what we in the Socialist Workers' Party are about, and that's why we urge those of you who like what we have to say, come and join us and be part of that struggle.